All right, hello everyone. I'm Paul, and here we can see uh, a rather broad selection of polygeek body fossils from the Lebanese Lagerstätten of Hackle of Hackle and Hula of uh, Cretaceous age. One of these worms is not like the others, to say the least, and I suppose the answer is fairly obvious, if not by the coloration alone. So this chappy here, in the bottom left, is Rollins Keter Myoplina, a very unusual polychaete in the fact that it preserves almost the entirety of its muscle tissue in three dimensions, but completely lacks all of its hard recalcitrant structures, which, as we can see, make up the vast majority of the polychaete fossil record. So it provides a sort of very bizarre case study in... I guess, the oddities of the taphonomic process of fossilization. <laughs> so, I'm proud to present today the curious case of Rollins Keter myoplina and the reconstruction of fossilized myoanatomy within the fossil record. So, what is fossilization? Well, fossilization can be broadly defined as the replication and replacement of organic structures and tissues by phosphate group minerals, <laughs> resulting in high-fidelity fossil material that can preserve cellular details. Now, yeah, probably many of you are familiar with the different modes of fossilization. We've, I believe we've had all three in this morning's presentations, Austin type, Duchanteau type, and SSF type fossilization. But there's a fourth type that I personally like to call, and I apologize for my butchering of the French language now, but it's serin, or, yeah, serin type preservation, sorry, <laughs> which effectively we see this fossilization of soft tissue in three dimensions in situ. And when we check it under the SEM, we can see that the muscle fibres in this example of our titular worm are preserved in exquisite detail. So, fossilization is got a fairly unusual distribution to time, mostly limited to the Cambrian in the forms of Austin, Doshanto, and SSF. But this latter type, this Terran fossilization, is rather more liberal in its placement during the geological time, <coughs> mainly peaking in the Jurassic and diminishing into the Cretaceous before petering out just before, just into the Neogene. So, in the Cretaceous, mid uh, late Cretaceous, in the Cenomanian, we in Lebanon we start to see these unusual polychaete body fossils. So, naturally, as we've seen today, Fossilization is a very useful tool for paleontologists. More or less, we owe almost the entire uh, metazoan and bilaterian embryonic record to this taphonomic process. And it's very useful in the fact that it preserves those rare tissues that we really never see in many taxa, such as this, uh, this gut preserved in, tish in situ on a trilobite hypostome. So it's a very useful tool for exploring the soft-bodied anatomy of many creatures which we generally don't know much about in terms of their soft tissue. But it does have its limitations. So here we have a specimen of a unicid, Unicites joinvillii from Lebanon, and you can see two very poorly preserved longitudinal muscle bands that flow, flow down the body, that run down the body on this ventral surface from memory. When we check it under UV light, these fluoresce in this rather nice, brilliant white color. And we can see they're not particularly consistent down the body, and they're very poorly preserved on the whole. And this is about, for the most part, what we get. I mean, obviously, in the Santana Formation, you get rather nice subcellular preservation, but it's generally limited in its extent to the point where it's more of a novelty rather than something that's taxonomically informative. However, this is where we break the mold. Not, so Rollins Keter Myoplina, not the uh, muscle-bound, rather self-opinionated former lead singer of punk band Black Flag, Ron, uh, not Rollins, Keaton Myoplina, but Henry Rollins, but a rather more badass worm. So, here we have a, a selection of uh, specimens of Rollins, Keaton Myoplina. You can see it's preserved with a sort of variety of secondary diagenic minerals, like these uh, iron manganese to uh, iron oxides. And so the largest one here in the middle left is probably about 12 centimetres long, and down to this tiny one here and here, which are about only 2 centimetres long, more juvenile specimens. And as we can see, these fluoresce this very similar brilliant white colour. When we start zooming in, though, we can start seeing some exquisite details in the layering of the musculature of these animals. So we can see on the side this massive parapodial musculature, uh, which is very dense, very effectively, it's like the compression of all the rhomite. So it's very chaotic and very poor, uh, very difficult to differentiate. But we can also see, along here we have circular muscle tissue on this ventral surface, which is here 
if you can see, overlying these longitudinal muscles. So we have effectively enough three-dimensional information to be able to reconstruct this animal in three dimensions, which, or the bioanatomy of these animals in three dimensions, which is something that is never really been able, you know, we're never able to really do in the fossil record due to the limited quantity of preservation of such soft tissues. But as I mentioned earlier, paradoxically, this image here more or less represents the full extent of the hard parts found within this taxon. So generally, you can see two acicula, which Luke earlier mentioned, internal bristles, or kitty, which are used to support the musculature of the parapodia. And they're generally very poorly preserved, these rather uh, just ghosted in iron oxide minerals. And we generally don't see very much of these at all, only where they're really ex where only where the muscle tissue decides it wants to expose these structures. So a very bizarre contrast from the paradigm of the fossil record indeed. So why is this not just some form of, I guess, taphonomic novelty? Well, research in the past decade or so has shown that polycute myonatomy has a very strong affinity with at least taxonomy to the family level, at least. There's no, been no real exploration at the generic level yet. But the most common arrangement is, you can see in the top left, is this two, two dorsal and two ventral, bad, two dorsal and two ventral arrangement of longitudinal muscles down the body, and as you can see here in this red stuff, and but with a complete absence of circ, a complete absence of circular muscle tissue, something that's come to light very recently within the field of polycute myoanatomy. So, given that we have enough three-dimensional muscle tissue to preserve or to be able to reconstruct the myonatomy of Ronsky to myoplina. If we're able to get a good reconstruction, surely we can tie that to a family and actually sort of try and get a taxonomic description just from the soft tissues alone, something that's never really been attempted before within the fossil record. So we set off to the darkest corners of the paleo labs in Bristol in order to use the rather antiquated device, the camera lucida, which is most famous for its use in describing the enigmatic faunas of the Burgess Shale, as you can see from this specimen of Anomalocaris. We also headed off to the NHM to do some CT scanning, although here visualized is the CT facilities at the University of Warwick, where I'm currently studying. We set off there to get to scan a, a wide array of modern comparators so that we could get a good idea from first hand exactly what taxa, what modern families and taxa, taxonomic groups we can compare to our fossilized worm. Here I have an example of uh, a worm that may be familiar to either fishermen or those who uh, keep uh, exotic fish, uh, the blood worm the, of, of the Glyceridae. So you can see here the muscle structure. We've got two dorsal, two ventral, and this continual of uh, longitudinal muscle, and this rather continuous layer of circular muscle tissue interrupted where the parapodia, parapodia muscle, comes out to the side of the body and at the ventral nerve cord at the bottom, marked in green there. So we set to work. This is a specimen, as you might expect, of Rodin's myoplena, and when we overlay a camera lucid drawing, we can see there's a fair amount of myoanatomy preserved. So on the side, marked in blue, we have this massive parapodial musculature. Again, as I said earlier, quite poorly arranged, quite poorly organized in contrast to other muscle groups. Down the center of the body in green, we have the <coughs> muscles of the intestine, uh, rather nicely preserved if a little uninformative. But most notably in red, we have a, a rather discontinuous arrangement, probably due to the cleavage along the uh, surface of the fossil, of this longitudinal musculature. And if you look down the body, you can probably see it's about three or four, maybe. But there's one region of pertinent interest here. And when we zoom in and reconstruct here, we can count a total of, on this dorsal surface, four longitudinal muscle bands in two pairs. So we have the dorsal pair, obviously uh, over right of the, the intestinal muscle down the midline of the body. And then on the flanks, or more towards the flanks, we have another set of longitudinal muscles uh, the dorsolateral longitudinal muscle pairs. So we can count four on this dorsal surface. If we flip over onto the ventral surface, in a very similar image as, as we saw before, we can see this relationship on the ventral surface. So down the middle of the body here, we have the ventral nerve cord, or at least what remains of it, and that's 
interrupt so that is interrupting either side this these circular muscle layers on this ventral surface which are when they reach the parapodial musculature this rather complex arrangement down here further interrupted Un underlying the circular muscle tissue we have another longitudinal muscle band approximately half the width of this circular muscle which uh, if we infer bilateral symmetry as as you might expect of polychaetes uh, we can infer another one on the other side, probably underlying this circular muscle tissue up there. If you flip back onto the dorsal surface, though, in this image, overlaying another camera lucida drawing, when it as it wants to, ah, there we go, uh, we can see more circular muscle tissue marked in this uh, turquoisey colour, with overlying this uh, rather chaotic arrangement of longitudinal muscles that aren't exceptionally preserved here, but we can count sort of three, three, four maybe, if we're so fortunate. So, in terms of our muscular reconstruction, we can conclude that we have four dorsal longitudinal muscles, a dorsal pair and a dorsal lateral pair, and two ventral longitudinal muscles that make a pair. It, in addition to having circular muscle tissue on the dorsal and ventral surface, interrupted at the, parapodia, at the parapodial margins and at the ventral nerve cord. Now, there's only one family in the entire, well, in the entirety of, or among the polychaetes, which bears this rather unique arrangement, and that is, as I believe Luke had an image on his presentation earlier, but the is the fireworms, so, or the amphenomidae. So, this, yeah. And so, this is the rather old-fashioned thing, but a very recent reconstruction, published just last week. I haven't even had time to look through it properly. Just found out about it yesterday. But, um... We can see that a very similar reconstruction is produced here, transversal muscle, as it's sometimes referred to, on the dorsal and ventral surface, in addition to these two long dorsal ventral longitudinal muscles. And um, here they reconstruct it as a fully continuous uh, layer of muscle for the uh, dorsal pair, but we still got this dorsolateral pair. So that's all very good. We can also compare this to the CT data we acquired ourselves. And we can see in this specimen of Arcanome SP, of the Arcanomidae, and Euthocoplinata of the um, Amphenomine in particular. But these are, they both have a very similar muscular structure. Okay. This is just a, a brief animation of the same thing. And you can see it's a very similar reconstruction. It's dorsal ventral circular muscle tissue with four longitudinal muscles on the surface and on the dorsal surface and two on the ventral. So, we can further compound this theory with uh, a number of anatomical traits which we're fortunate to have, including these biremis podia, parapodia in the top, in the top left with cirri, uh, these aciculi in biremis, uh, that are biremis, and also the preservation of uh, this unarmed pharynx, which is a very, very distinct diagnostic. So in summary, we can say that it has all these features. Maybe, maybe not dashing good looks, but uh, certainly it has all these features. And this is a reconstruction of what we can get. But there's one peculiar thing. These, as you can see here on the sides of the animal, these keti, where are they? Well, Chloe SP is, a, is an extant amphenomage. You can see these bristles preserved very well. It's these hard structures that we're really missing. So it's rather bizarre that we're missing these structures on the whole. And I guess the pocket theory is these are normally composed of calcium carbonate, so it's possibly reasonable to assume that they dissolve during the rather acidic process of phosphatization. So, we can conclude more or less for the most part that it's an amphenomid based on its muscular only, musculature only, which can be further reinforced by uh, the presence of uh, particular anatomical traits. And it represents an unusual paradigm in contrast to the rest of the fossil record. In terms of explanations, they're few and far between. Our understanding of phosphatization at the real in-depth level is very poor at the minute. But there's a few pocket theories we can whip out, such as the concentration of eternal body phosphate, physiochemical characters of the musculature of the animal, or the density of the muscular, essentially how ripped it is. Uh, unfortunately, there's no real experimental evidence for any of these, so we're more or less left a bit in the air in respect to this. So, in conclusion, Ronsquito myoplina preserves the entirety of its myoanatomy in calcium phosphate, allowing diagnosis of stanphenomid. Two, represents an unorthodox taphonomic case whereby muscular tissues are preserved at the expense of recalcitrant structures. And three, drivers for the extent of phosphatization observed in Ronsquito myoplina are poorly understood, 
highlighting a gulf in our understanding of fossilisation. Before we adjourn for a well-earned coffee break, I would like to thank my colleagues at the University of Bristol, NHM, and uh, University of Copenhagen for their uh, help with this project. And I'd like to thank Warwick for funding me at the minute. And I'll leave you with perhaps the only Henry Rollins quote I could find related to fossils, which is, every single record I have is a fossil. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>